with the virtual applied data science training institute. This is funded by NIH, and then we've run this for a couple of years. Um, we did a spring series at the beginning of the year, and then this is the fall uh, training uh, series. Now, this time around, this is a little uh, different. If you looked at uh, the schedule, this is supposed to be a 10-week uh, program. But the first three weeks is what we call the pre-training uh, section. So the pre-training section is for those who may lack uh, the foundational concept of data science, because we want to uh, bring you up to speed because the intent originally was to uh, continue with the with the spring training series because this uh, three weeks this were all covered during the, the spring. But for those of you who are not part of the spring uh, training series, or for those who lack uh, the foundational concept, we want to bring you up to speed before we go to the main uh, sections. So for this, uh, Dr. Musa Dumbia will be the, the leading uh, facilitator for this uh, program. And then uh, the main sections will start in, uh, I think on September 22nd. So Dr. Mus uh, Musa Dumbia will give a, an overview and then we'll watch the recordings from the spring uh, training uh, series on foundations of data science. And then we'll discuss it. If you have any questions, you can pause, you can, then we'll discuss it. I think what we did, uh, we should have sent this to you uh, earlier on for you to review uh, the recordings. But for the next two, we'll do that. We'll send you the recordings you review it on your own, and then when we meet, we'll facilitate it. And that if you have any questions, clarification of any concept, then we'll discuss it. And then uh, the, the, again, the main section starts September 22nd. This time around, uh, this training series is project based. And by that, I mean that uh, you there will be hands on uh, training. We'll give you. Projects, we have to complete the project. You have to submit that in GitHub before you get what uh, the certificate of completion. In the past, just attending it, uh, I, I award you the certificate of uh, participation. But this I want to call it the certificate of completion, which means you have to uh, complete uh, the project submitted to get that certificate. Now, if you don't need the certificate for whatever reason, then you don't have to stress yourself out doing so. But at least if you are here, then it means you want to learn something. And then I will encourage all of you to at least attempt uh, to do uh, uh, the project. Um, uh, Nana and uh, uh, William, you want to add anything? Or crazy? Um, so I, I would say um, please if, if you are not speaking uh please uh mute yourself and I will do that on the first day I did it I forgot to do that if you don't mind at least Turn your cameras on and then wave your left hand, uh, rather wave your right hand for me to know that you are here. Yeah. So, yeah, this way. Yeah, so, so yeah, so John, thanks so much. I, I would say this is, uh, this is going to be a very rich experience from at least looking back to our first, uh, our first uh, uh, session. Uh, uh, what what you you get what you put in. Let, let's put it that way. Uh, office hours will be offered. Uh, you have the video lectures and uh, students who really excel in this are the ones who put in the extra time. Uh, I.e., uh, you you have to make the effort, and the resources are there. 
Uh, you try things out and when you hit a block, you come to office hours and we'll help you through that. So, so that's what I can add, but it's been a very rich experience for, uh, for, uh, past, for our past uh, uh, students. Yeah. So, so John, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thank you, William. Uh, Nana, can I, you let them know uh, where to find the, the recordings without being in Slack? It's in the uh, invitation that I was sent to um, the email that you got. You scroll down mm. the last page, there's recordings over there. You can see Foundation of Data Science. Uh, you can see um, a day one, day two. So each, each module will post it right there, then you can just look at it. Yeah, so from next week, we'll try to post it at least a day earlier so you have you will have the time to review the recordings before the discussion or sessions are the following day. Anyone has any questions before we start? The only the only thing I may like to add is that uh, it will be very beneficial to go through the projects. They really mean that uh, not only will you learn more, but you can use the projects that you have done as a portfolio when you are also looking for a, 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 a job. Well, most jobs will request something that you have done in the past as an example of what you can do. So it will benefit every person, especially those who are planning to uh, move into the field or change careers, or even advance their careers in the field, to go through the projects and then do something meaningful that will help you not only now, but in the future. Thank you. Okay, anyone has any questions before I hand over to Dr. Dubia? Okay, so if there are no questions, again, uh, the chat room is there. If during the presentation you want, you have a question or comment, you can post it in the chat uh, area, or you can raise your hand and then uh, uh, Dr. Dumbia or William or Nana or one of them, Kwesi will uh, alert uh, uh, the, the presenter and then we can answer the question and then uh, discuss it. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Dumbia is a professor in the Department of Mathematics here at Howard University. Uh, he teaches uh, data science. Now he even have uh, a Coursera uh, uh, lecture, do you call it lecture, called for linear algebra and data science. So I'm sure he will tell you about it. You can go to Coursera and then uh, check it out. Uh, he was part of this uh, uh, program uh, in the past, and then he will also lead one of the uh, main uh, sessions. So today, uh, he's here, he's the, uh, the lead uh, facilitator for this. And then in addition to uh, Dr. Kwasi Yabua Afeni, who is on here, I don't know if uh, Dr. Nwafu is here. Dr. Nwafu is also part of uh, the discussion group. And then I'm also uh, here. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Uh, Dumbia. All right, thanks for the nice introduction. Hello, everybody. So let me know if you can see my slides. Can you see? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So in this session, we are going to expose you to a video that will uh, uh, tackle these three points. So the term data science will be clear to you. I know the term data science, many of you guys probably been asked before, what is data science? And then uh, what do you need to become a data science? So Dr. Professor Prem from University of Maryland did a wonderful job explaining that. In addition to explaining data science, he also touched our statistics. And he discussed uh, the hypothesis, the null hypothesis, what is it? Why we need statistics in data science? 
And at the end of the video, he did a case study using a decision tree. So without further ado, let me share the video with you. Oh, Nana, you have a video or should I share? No, go ahead and share. Okay, all right, let me. So. So the introduction part, I'm going to uh, forward that part, uh, John, Nana, right? I don't know how to, the first uh, 10, 15 minutes of the video is about introduction. So I'm going to forward that. Can you see? Uh, let me, uh, I want to okay, forward. Yes, yes, we can see it. Yes. Okay. I need. I want to forward. We can't hear him. You cannot hear? Oh. You can't hear? You, you have to share the audio too. Oh, how you do that? We can't hear. Nana, how do you share the audio too? Let, let me, oh, let, 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 let me, let me, let me, yeah, let me. I think, what about now? Unorganized phenomena. Yeah, it's good. And organizing it. Okay. So that we can figure out either what's happening, why something happened, or where things are going. Right. And um, I like to, you know, use this this graphic because at first, you know, when I look at this, I see just, you know, chaos. But if you stare a little longer at it you know, you start to notice things, right? And, um, you know, first I see like, you know, little, I always think of periodical things, right? So you see like a little sine wave emerging a little bit and um, there's, there's several light bulbs and there's, you know, charts and graphs. And so the question is, you know, how do we make sense of this, right? Uh, for those uh, physicists in the audience, um, it's it's really taking the energy of the phenomena and trying to make it more organized right like energy changes forms and it goes from you know organized to disorganized but it's still the same so really what we do a lot of what we do is organization right you'll find that like how do we get more structure of the situation um so that we can figure out uh what why and where where is it going Okay. <clears throat> All right, so a little bit more formal. Um, it's a multidisciplinary field that uses scientific methods, processes, algorithms, and systems to extract knowledge and insights from structured and unstructured data. This is the big part, right? The multiple disciplines are mathematics. So I find myself using calculus all the time, right? Partial differential equations all the time so for those of you who took pde and were like what's the point we use it all the time um, statistics this is probably the most um, readily identifiable identifiable part of data science uh, and, and if you were talk if you were to talk to a data scientist you know you would hear things like i code in python models using uh, best practices from statistics, right? And uh, this whole idea of having to 
build models uh, and, and, you know, for projections for what, what it is right now and why things happened is, is based on sampling. And there's no way to sample without having uh, an excellent understanding of statistics and making sure that your sampling methods are sound. Right? So uh, straight away, that is usually the divider between someone who is programming or who's a developer and someone who's a data scientist. The data scientist must have a sound understanding of statistics. Um, and that's why it's hard to get, right? It's, it's hard to get statisticians, it's hard to get programmers, it's even harder to get statisticians who want to program, right? Um, computer scientists, so um, we do a lot of programming and I think what's happened, and it, and it makes sense that it's happened this way, is big data has changed it so that you have to have a, a pretty strong computer science background. And what I mean by that is we spend a lot of time using tools like Spark, we use a lot of tools like Dask, we're constantly thinking about um, uh, horizontal scaling, we use cloud computing, um, there are experiments in quantum computing, so um, that it that leads to having a background in computer science and you have to be able to specialize in these fields as well so again more complexity to the area right so start with just a programmer that's one thing you have to understand statistics now okay fine and now you also have to understand how to deal with these big data technologies which are challenging has anybody set up spark is anybody using spark in the audience yeah and uh william did, did you did you enjoy setting up spark I think you're muted. It, take, it takes, on. yeah, it takes some effort, uh, but uh, I have users that I have to uh, support. So you don't want to say I don't know. So yeah, it takes it takes an it takes an effort, but everything is online. Uh, the first time was difficult, but once you've done it once, then it's yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and cool. it is it's particularly challenging, you know. So yeah. you have to. The idea is we can't solve these problems with our laptops. The data is too big, or even if even if you can get it on your laptop, the algorithm is too time consuming for the resources you have. So you have to find a way to farm out the processing and or the memory required to deal with it. Uh, and that by itself can be challenging. Right? Yeah, and, and straight away you have to have the resources, right? So costs come into play. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, 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 an, a brilliant peer of mine uh, out at the uh, University of California recently published a paper uh, and he could not, could not compute uh, the results of the paper on his uh, laptop and certainly not even on University of California's, um, uh, he's in Santa Clara, so he could not even um, process it all uh, on in their labs. So he had to go to the cloud. And what's fascinating is, is the papers computate, this is just a research paper, right? The research papers computational costs were $30,000, right? So this is like where the field is going. It's the amount of processing power that is needed to pull off these results are expensive. So expensive that you can't really do it locally. Like, are you going to set up a computing cluster in, in your office? Do you want to build a lab on campus? Is your lab strong enough to even handle these things? We'll talk about some of the advances in deep learning, which require, you know, thousands of GPUs. So um, an understanding of how to tackle uh, big data is also very important. And then uh, the information science, right? So you know how do we how do we curate this data how do we understand this data and uh, are there any librarians in the audience by the way the deepest deepest respect for librarians so i i think librarians are making a comeback making a comeback and i say that because you have to manage all this data Right, like we, and, and if you see this in, in institutions that are very mature and have models. So, for example, Tesla. Tesla's largest endeavor in AI is full self driving. And uh, they've made advances. 
Uh, and the way they do it is using a technology called supervised learning and uh, via a deep learning model. And we'll talk more about what that is. But the short of it is they use um, humans to label video clips of good driving and to label video clips of bad driving. And then the machine learns what's good and what's bad, very much like how we teach our kids. You know, they'll do something and we'll say, okay, that's good. And they register that. We'll do, we'll, they'll do something, we'll say that's bad. They register that and they learn incrementally through trial and error over and over and over again. And so these data labelers or you know, uh, librarians of the data, the keepers of this data uh, are really what makes Tesla go in this situation. I mean, they have data that's being generated from the drivers, but someone's got to sit there and label it. Now they're talking about automatic labeling. Um, and at some point when the machines get context, that may happen. Um, but right now you can get a job as the, a data labeler. Uh, even to this day, Google uh, has people monitoring their index saying that this is appropriate, this is inappropriate. This is linked to this topic, this is not linked to this topic. And that is because for all, for all of humanity's shortcomings, we're still state of the art, right? And uh, what we understand, the machines don't yet. And so if we can harness that collective understanding from you know, data labelers and people who are well-versed in the phenomena we're trying to model, um, that makes the machines learn and understand from our context. So very, very important, right? You have to, you, ha you build these models, but then you have to have someone or teams to curate and keep them from straying, lying off. Okay. Um, so we'll go through each of these. So the basics of statistics. So the science of making a prediction about an entire population based on a sample, right? And so, you know, when the next attack will occur, uh, we, the, the US government said the attack was gonna occur last Wednesday, right? Uh, I think that was early, but we did have cyber attacks. Uh, and so I guess the Putin decided to wait a week for the full blown attack. Um, you know, who will win the next presidential election? Uh, you know, how is it done, right? We do it through sampling probabilities, hypothesis testing, even now, right? So a lot of the manual processes that are used in statistical modeling um, have been automated. Uh, through these data science pipelines and models, but still you have to have very good practices on how you sample, right? Are you going to sample randomly? Are you looking at a target group? Uh, um, you know, what do you expect your confidence intervals to be, right? So um, all of these things have to be factored in and um, you'll see some examples of that as well. Uh, on, on, a, on a point of this, this is a, key, a key part of this is that we take we take samples to try to predict what's going to happen with the population. We run a trial. We run a trial, let's say, on uh, a COVID drug. And we say, OK, the trial did very well, say a vaccine, right? We run a trial, and we, we, we have the vaccine, and the vaccine does very well on the sample population. And then we say, you know, we sampled randomly, and we sampled across different age groups, and the vaccine worked well. So we believe that it is going to do well for the general population, okay? So it's a model. It may not have AI in it, but certainly it has statistics in it. The other side of this is what happens if you try to get access to the entire population, right? So one thing is, we, you know, we don't have everybody's health data. We don't, you know, if we did, then that would be different. But like, if we don't have it, so we have to, and we don't have access to everybody. So we have to take a sample and try to run these trials and then extrapolate out. But what if you could get access to the population? At that point, you, you minimize or get close, you asymptotically approach the population. At that point, you minimize the sampling uh, effects 
and you're able to make uh, a better prediction because you've gotten so much more data. And that is the idea behind big data attacks. So one, once, and we use these in combination, but one side is, hey, we don't have all the data. Let's, let's sample appropriately, build a model and, and project. The other side is, let's just go get all the data and let's try to store it. And then we will, you know, maybe not even have to build a model. If we have everything we need, it can be that we solve this problem by just sorting, right? So for example, you're in, in the Arcos case, we're trying to find where uh, anomalies are occurring across the country for uh, um, opioid dispensing, right? So is that an AI problem? Maybe. We can build a model to say, all right, you know, we've sampled across uh, various places with, very, with char certain characteristics. And we found that when uh, these characteristics are met, we believe that there is a higher incidence of opioid abuse. Okay. Okay, fine. But what if you just got everybody's demographics and you got it down to, let's say, the zip code? Okay. And then you just sort by ha those, those factors and look for where the um, amount of opioids per capita down to the zip code or maybe zip code combined with say the pharmacy are most egregious, right? Now, now the problem is, is there's so much data, right? It comes in daily and you're talking about billions of records, but what if you have the ability to get at that, right? So then you don't really need this model. It turns into a sort or, or a, a grouping problem. So something to look for. And ultimately, we're going to talk more about big data. But in time, big data is not going to be a problem. Any ideas why? Co computing power and, uh, and resources are going to be available. Because uh, if you're able to load the data, and you, you have the data, and you have the resources, then you're back to where we are now. Right. Yeah, and I think, you know, the other thing is quantum computing uh, is real, is coming. There are already quantum computers that we have access to, right? Google declared quantum supremacy, saying that they could basically compute uh, arbitrary statistics. Uh, and operations on uh, data using quantum computers about a year ago. And uh, there's a company in College Park called D-Wave, uh, which has a quantum computer that AWS uh, uses internally. And so the idea is because, again, for the physics kids, uh, for the, given the amount of data that can be stored at the quantum level, the entire world's data Every piece of data that is stored right now in the world can be stored on a single quantum computer, right? Single quantum computer. And so this concept of having to work in parallel and, and you know, buy up all, this, all these resources is going to go out the window once quantum hits and becomes readily available. I'm just looking at the chat as, as we go. I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, Okay, so yes, quantum computing. Very good, Alexander. So, and I would say, I mean, the prototypes are here. It's just, these things are not impossible. They're just very expensive. So let's say five years, maximum 10 years, right? We'll have access to these machines that can process data at any scale. And the, the, the and I'll, I'll draw this out for you, but the big, the big breakthrough in, in quantum, uh, one is yes, we're able to store all this data. Fantastic, we can put the whole world's data on a circuit board, okay? And I don't have to go into different places, no problem. But the, the big thing is its ability to work in parallel. Have any of you worked on like parallel algorithms? Yeah, so this is a very important, right? Because right now, if you're working on any kind of you know, remotely large data set, uh, sometimes you run everything at once, but it turns out that things can be done in parallel most of the time. And so to, to get things done in a timely manner, we split out tasks 
and we work in parallel. The work we did for DEA to get Arcos off the ground is largely parallel algorithms. algorithms. So what quantum buys you is effectively infinite memory. And why is that important? Every time you fork, right? Uh, let me see if I can actually, let me see if I can draw on this. Hold on a second here. The zoom will let it come through or the, uh, let's see if I can draw here. It may not uh, let me do it from there. Oh yeah, it's in the middle, it's great. Okay, so if, and I'll, I'll sketch it out later if I can't do it here, but by having the ability to ha have so much memory, every time you fork and create a new process, they require memory to bookkeep. So, you, you know, you have four processes that you spin out, right? Or five processes that we spin out. Each one of these processes has to have a memory of where it was spawned. And uh, so there's like locks and uh, bookkeeping that go on for these processes that are running and they need to know when to come back. So five manageable. Now make these five 50 million processes. Okay. How are we going to manage all those processes? Well, it turns out that cr critical to managing those processes means we have to be able to store data and track data on those processes. And that is made possible via quantum. Right? We can do it, you know, at thousands, millions now. But when you get to a point where you can do it effectively indefinitely, and you're, you have all this data in front of you, we'll be able to rip through these problems that are very, very difficult now. Quantum computing will change everything, everything, uh, and hopefully for the better, hopefully for the better. Okay. Uh, so again, using random samples to make confident statements about an entire population. We're making intelligent guesses, speculation. Uh, you'll see we use several algorithms to, to do these things, depending on whether if it's a classification problem or regression problem. Um, but that's the idea behind statistics uh, in modeling. Um, so we look at um, the sample. And um, you know, depending on what we're trying to do, we make sure that we sample randomly without bias. Uh, and then where are, are, are any people deal with missing data a lot? Yeah. Um, missing data comes up all the time. I don't know if it's a phenomenon that's more common in the federal government because every federal project we worked on seems to have enormous amounts of missing data, but we see it in the private sector as well. And so, um, and it's important, right? This is another reason why you have to have a strong statistical background because if you sample on data that is say, not missing at random, then you know that there's been um, mischief or that the, the question was stated unfairly. You know, if I ask everybody, what is your salary? Okay, some of you may answer, some of you may not, and some of you may answer, but tell me, you know, the, uh, a lie about your salary. Don't answer, okay, by the way. So uh, that doesn't mean the answer doesn't exist. It just means I've asked the question inappropriately. So we have missing data and it's missing and it's not missing at random. It's missing because I asked inappropriately. Or maybe you didn't want to tell me and you're supposed to, right? So you have to have uh, a good understanding of uh, why data is not where it needs to be. And uh, there are several kinds, right? So missing completely at random, missing at random, and not missing at random. And we'll talk about those uh, as well. So again, you know, when we build these models, we have to sample. So we have to understand, you know, what is it? Uh, what, how are we sampling? What are the, the factors and how do we do it with um, best practice? Appropriately, appropriately. So then we look at, you know, another thing we do is we look at the shapes of these, uh, of the data. Um, so sometimes things are normally distributed. The hope is that most things are, but it turns out a lot of things aren't normally distributed. Wealth is not normally distributed. Um, how uh, COVID impacts certain populations is not normally distributed, right? So there's actually quite a few things that are skewed. Um, and when that happens, we look to see where does it accumulate. So a lot of statistics is going on. And uh, again, we look at spreads, right? Standard deviations all the time, all the time. Okay. 
So again, samples give statistics and populations, which we may never know, give parameters, right? The true mean. So, you know, let's say you're trying to predict um, what the actual height is. What's the average height for um, everybody in the United States? Okay. So there is an average height, right? That parameter exists. We don't know what it is, but we're going to try to, let's say, sample some group randomly, uh, or, or that is also representative of what the popu US population is, and then we'll take their heights and hopefully be able to extrapolate that forward to say what the true parameter is of the height for all uh, people in the United States. I'm just looking at the chat. Uh, um, so Lane says, because we don't charge for data, it also has to be posted on time. Oh, okay, sorry, yes, yeah. All right, um, let me move this chat to a different window so I can see what's happening as we go. All right. <clears throat> yeah, some of are subsets of the population we study. Okay, so, all right, so the central, um, the central limit theorem, and this is uh, important, and it's used as we sample even within the models we create, right? So the idea here is, as the amount of trials go up, um, the true parameter will be approximated closer and closer. Um, so, you know, the message is that the more data you can get, uh, more quality data you can get, uh, the closer you're going to be in your uh, approximations. And even if the phenomena, this is important, and you, you'll see it as you start building models, even if the phenomena you're looking at is not normally distributed, the way you build your model and go through selections um, should be normally distributed. And what do, what do I mean by that? You'll see it when we go through an example, but the, the idea is, uh, when you start to approximate some, some phenomena, you will make decisions in your models on, uh, okay, how many, let, let's say, what level of sensitivity do I want to apply using this algorithm? Or what level of precision do I want to apply using this algorithm? And um, what happens when we um, learn uh, the phenomena and then we say, try to apply that to a test set to see if we're generalizing correctly. And, and what happens when we change the distribution of uh, training and test, and how does that change the model's accuracies, right? And in, indeed, a central question in data science, uh, and, and really math, physical phenomena overall, is uh, where do you draw the line? You know, is it, is it uh, we split 50-50 on training and test sets? Is it, uh, um, is it the Donbass area in Ukraine? Like, wh where do you draw the line? And so this, this problem, uh, is 80-20 is a good one. So um, you have to figure out what happens when there's different um scenarios and so what we do it's something called cross-validation uh and those of you in in um who have statistics backgrounds have seen this we apply the same things internally right so what will happen is, is we'll we'll build some model and uh we'll we'll say hey we're going to use this set of data and we'll, we'll use this as training and then we'll use we'll set up part of that data to be test so that we can say, all right, well, we've learned this and now we want to project to see if we got it right. And we'll check our results with the test set. You'll see an example of this as we go forward. And the question is, well, what did you choose as training and test? Because just the order of things can change things around, right? It's, and it, it can be quite telling if you chose to use maybe the best samples in your training data to get you know accuracy on the test data so and that makes the model look artificially good as you build it but when you go out into the real world it won't be uh, as accurate right so so what do we do 
Well, uh, in, in terms of when you have this uncertainty, one way to deal with it is you say, well, let's just try different combinations of the train test splits. Okay, and when you run those train test splits, the more you do and the more combinations you run, you should start to approach what the actual accuracy is of the data set on most importantly, unseen data. Right? So the same, and, and how do we do that? We use statistics. Uh, and the more trials we do and the more sampling we do, uh, and, the, and effectively the more models we create with different train test splits gives us a more realistic idea of what the accuracy will be when it goes out to data we've never seen. Yes, exactly. Right. So stratified sampling or, or cross validation. So again, another another um, uh, point where you have to be well versed in statistics and best practices in order to field these models. If you field a model without cross validation, the, the, the comment is the question is going to come up. How did you decide where to split? How did you decide what was training, what was test? How do you know? Right. And um, I mean, and th this is a, a, a very, very big question because what happens is if you just build a model on what you, on, on all the data, like for example, uh, I have a peer a friend of mine who is um, 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 political science, right? Political science major. And um, he says, you know, we, ne we never do train test splits. We look at all the data and we fit a curve to it. You know, we use ARIMA and uh, we fit a curve to it and we forecast going forward. I said, okay, that's great. But how do you know that it's going to work on data that you've not seen before? He says, well, you know, we, we look at it and if it's out of shape, then we just run another model. And I said, okay, well, why don't you try train, train test splits? Why don't you train on maybe the first 50% and see if it extrapolates well to the last 50%, the latest data, right? And he says, okay, we could do that. But the problem is, is we would lose um, predictive power, right? And that's true. But you also run the risk of uh, one of the biggest problems in data science, overfitting. All right, it looks great in the lab, but it dies as soon as you let it out, right? So what we do is, you know, how do we figure out if we can build something that does not die when it goes out in production? And the way you do that is, is you simulate it, right? So what we're gonna say is we're gonna say, look, we have this data set, let's cut it so that we have no idea what 50% of it looks like or 80 or 20% of it looks like, and we'll try different cuts, okay? And when we do that and we run the models and train on this section and then predict on this section, you get to see if your model actually generalizes well on data that it's not seen before, before having to go out publicly and then you know, pull back your predictions and, and reassess, right? So, and again, how do we do that? We do that through statistical sampling. So two different thoughts. One gives you better predictive power, but can overfit and needs to be redone as you as you drift away from the actual phenomena. Um, and the other one simulates what it's like to not have data. That is the standard when we build models now using data science and AI, right? You'll see um, accuracies for uh, training and you'll see accuracies for what we call either validation or test. And the reality is, is your training accuracy could be 100%, nobody cares. What matters is how accurate you were on unseen data, right? You could have accuracy of 60% in training, but if your accuracy was say 95% on data that you've not seen before, that's what counts, right? So you have to be able to do, to show that. And we use statistics in order to do that, largely based on cross-validation, simulating the process of not having the data so that when we do go out in the field where we don't have the data, we have an expectation of what will happen. Yeah. So again, a, a big, big part of this, right? Statistical sampling. And the more trials, the better. Okay. Another example of this, uh, as trials go up, we approach the true parameters. Uh, the second most important chart probably in data science, right? Um, so the normal distribution, and what this is saying is that uh, one gene, one deviation to the left and right, 68.2 uh, 
7% uh, of observations will fall. Two deviations out is 95.45% and three deviations out is 99.73%, right? Now, what's important about this is, is we could have chose um, any of these probabilities, okay? We could have chose 65%. We could have chose 98%, right? Uh, and we could have chose 99.85%, right? Anybody have an idea why we, why we took these probabilities? I mean, they, they, they do model out on the curve well, but the biggest factor is that they map to integers, right? One, two, and three standard deviations on the normal distribution give you these parameters. But it's not like that's gospel, right? So it's just easy. The machines could care less about one, two, or three. We like it, okay? So, but it isn't important to know that in a normal distribution, things taper off in this geometric form. That's a big, big finding in statistics that helps us uh, address the probability of something happening um, and, and how to um, either change because it's very, very different than what we expect or say that something is within uh, range. Okay. Uh, I'll leave you all to complete this, okay? So, uh, and the, the idea here is it depends on where you are, right? In the, in the court systems, you could argue either way, but let's say uh, you're all innocent until proven guilty, right? We don't want to put someone away who is in fact innocent. So uh, we, we err this way. And uh, the same thing applies with hypothesis testing, right? Before we toss, uh, the existing hypothesis and idea, um, we give it the benefit of the doubt. It's up to us to disprove it. Why is that important? So you're, you're a data scientist or you're, you're working on some, some phenomena and you're trying to model it and you're trying to you know, build a prediction. And um, there may already be predictions about this phenomena. So it is now up to you to say that, hey, we have the same prediction, I agree or I have something entirely different. But what is different? How do you prove different, right? Is 96 versus 95 different? Maybe, it depends on the confidence intervals, it depends on how you sample, how many trials are there, right? So what we do as convention is we say that the existing hypothesis holds until you disprove it. And how do you disprove it? Depends on the factors in play. Most of the time we say 95% uh, confidence interval, and then we say plus or minus some thresholds, right? All of those are gonna be functions of how you sample um, and the um, uh, statistical properties of the distribution of your sample, right? So uh, it is, even though the models do a lot of work for us, it is still up to you to be able to prove that your model's hypothesis is either in line with the current hypothesis is or is completely new or is completely different from the existing hypothesis and all of that is done still through hypothesis testing we spend um you know two solid courses two solid classes on just hypothesis testing, right? So all the Z scores and the P values, all of that comes back into play. When you talk to a fellow data scientist, we'll sit there and say, what were the P values? At what confidence interval do you, did you put this out, right? What are the, you know, what are the plus minus? What is the margin of error? All of this is the lingo that is used because, you know, how does the decision maker know otherwise? I feel the model, let's say the existing model is at 90% accuracy. Uh, and it has 90% uh, um, confidence interval and it's plus or minus, let's say three. So it could be 87 to 93, right? And I walk in there and say, okay, my accuracy is 92%, right? And, and, and I say, my model is better. You need to feel my model. So now we get into, well, who's right? 
right? And the way we say who's right is, well, there's, no, there's never a number in statistics in isolation. There's got to be a confidence interval with the margin of error, right? So at what confidence is your data and what is the margin of error? And, and, and then we can get into, is your model in fact better than what is existing? So again, even though a lot of the statistical uh, uh, modeling and mathematical modeling has been automated, the way that we adjudicate and say that one model is better than the other or internally figure out which models, what is the, the likelihood of the model's real parameter accuracy is all managed through statistics, right? Okay. <clears throat> well, and you'll see examples of this. I'm starting at 20,000 feet so that you get an overview of what it is we do, uh, and then we'll step into some of these examples. So uh, how do we prove it? Through hypothesis testing, right? Uh, the point of hypothesis testing is to make sure we don't jump to bad conclusions. Um, they can be confusing. Xylitol versus Florida, I'll, I'll talk about this. Uh, and we're inherently speculating, albeit rigor rigorously. So we try to control the guessing by being conservative and use innocent until proven guilty. Right. How many of you have done a hypothesis test? Lots of you? Some of you? Yeah? So we do them all the time. And in papers that you publish, you'll have to specify whether or not, you know, what your parameters were and why you believe that this is either uh, in line with the current hypothesis that supports it, or that um, you believe that there is a new phenomena that's been uncovered here and that your hypothesis disproves uh, the existing hypothesis. Okay. Uh, I don't know, this is the null hypothesis. And you, the, you, 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 the, the ghost thing is just something that we do to make it more crystal, but um, you know, what is the null hypothesis? Some of you will maybe not like hypothesis testing. It's just so critical that we talk about it. Um, I can tell you that um, if you interview for a data scientist position, hypothesis testing will most likely come up, right? Because it's so important, right? How, how did you, you build a model. Okay, great. How do you know that it's accurate? How do you know that what you've done is different than what's being said? You know, for example, uh, when COVID hit in 2020, um, the thought from what was broadcast was that it was not going to be that bad. And I knew right away <laughs> that it was going to be very bad. And so, and you, you could have seen it, right? I remember being in the office doing napkin math saying it's, a, you know, at a minimum uh, quadratic or tertiary. Uh, and so, and then you, you know what happens as it spreads. And so, you know, how do you go out and say that your model for some phenomena is, is different? So you have to use hypothesis testing. And in that case, the null hypothesis was that it was not going to be bad. And of course we saw that it was very bad. So uh, it's the status quo, it's accepted. I can only be rejected and the burden of proof is on us. It was very easy to prove in COVID because we had, you know, so many people getting sick. So, and the uh, morbidity was high. Okay, so um, more on this. And uh, the alternative hypothesis tries to nullify the ghosts. So the null, right, null. And it's, a, it's strange why we say null, but I, I, I want you to, Think about null. Does any, does any, does, well, first, does anything jump out at you at the screen? Why do you, why do you think they use null? Any ideas? Who saw the newest Ghostbuster movie? Anybody? It's actually it's actually pretty good. Um, I like I liked it at least. There's a scene uh, towards the end that I thought was uh, very very strong. Let me see if I can make this uh, larger. But the idea here is um, that those of you, some of you may have realized, uh, noticed the null sign, right? And uh, yeah, and so that, that it's, it's interesting that the Ghostbusters chose to use the null sign with a ghost inside of it, right? So um, I, I say that the, the, a way to think of it is that the null, 
of the situation. The null hypothesis is the ghost of the situation. And the ghost of the situation is the existing hypothesis. It's what's here, right? Came before us, it's the ghosts, the ghosts of what was happening. And they could be right, they could be right, they could be wrong, but it's one way to look at it. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, it's important to note that uh, statistics and inferences are about populations, right? They're always approxima approximations. Um, however, um, and this is back to the quantum point, right? We're not using probabilities when we have the entire population. I want to know what, let's say, the, uh, the, the average GPA score is for every student at UTEP, currently enrolled at UTEP. Okay, so I could build a model and I could sample uh, very cleverly about uh, across UTEP and, and say, hey, this is you know, what we think it's going to be. Or I could just get everybody's uh, current GPA at UTEP and take the average. All right. So uh, again, yes. Yeah, so if we wanted to get age, we could do it. And of course, this is naive when the data set is small, but when the data set is gigantic, that is an approach that can be taken. Right? You have to think about, do you even need a model? Right? Can we get there by just getting all the data? Opium, the opium epidemic, honestly, as much as I love AI and building models, that whole thing is solvable by managing the data appropriately. Just getting your hands on the ability to manage all those transactions coming in and being able to fork out that data and then in a timely manner not being years but maybe hours or days come up and say hey we're seeing blips that are too high or um <clears throat> and you can model that even normally like hey you guys are two deviations out or you're beyond you know a, a a deviation out versus everybody else so a lot of these problems are solved by just being able to get your hands around the amount of data involved Okay. As much as I love building models, I'm just telling you. All right. So, okay. We're going to have some fun. Uh, th th who's seen Waldo? Anybody know who Waldo is? Nobody? Well, where's Waldo? Okay. All right. Good. Yes. So, um, uh, I, I, we're going to do a quick survey. Uh, and by the way, I am a, who, who has done surveys? Who, where, who, are you guys fans of surveys? Yeah, uh, I can tell you that, uh, yeah, and I'm watching your responses in the chat. So every organization that I have worked in, the largest impact that I feel like I've made have come from surveys. You know, like, for example, when I was at FINRA, there was this huge, uh exodus of staff everybody was, was leaving and they're like what are we going to do the management was having these big meetings about well, you know everybody's leaving what are we going to do we can't manage you know analyze everybody's data if everybody's leaving what's the story and so they're sitting there speculating and i said well why don't you ask the employees oh there's too many employees okay ask, ask a subset of them All right and and uh the point you have to make is always very interesting um, because it, it, you know, maybe, maybe a large part of the solutions to most problems is empathy. You need to be able to get out of your own skin and see the problem from someone else's point of view. I wish Putin would do that. Maybe he has, he doesn't care. Okay. But, uh, a, a lot of the solution gets, comes together that way. So, so what did I say to them? I said, look, you guys as senior leaders have your view as to why people are leaving. But perhaps what you think is entirely different than what the engineers are thinking. And then, you know, you cite certain studies and they start thinking about it. And, and ultimately, uh, I said, before you start, this is key, before you start spending money, maybe you want to do a survey. Before you start saying, hey, we need to increase comp, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a combination of things, right? Uh, so, okay, they agreed to do a survey. Surveys are cheap. You can use SurveyMonkey. There's all these tools you can put together. You have to be smart about how you sample, but you can get surveys done pretty quickly. All right. So we do a survey. I love surveys. Okay. And, it, and we ask, you have to be 
careful about the questions you ask. Uh, and, you know, we asked, like, what are the top uh, contributing factors to you, um, to your job, right? What do you view as most important? And through a series of questions, uh, we, we came down to what they valued the most, right? And it's actually very interesting. Very, very interesting what, what, the, uh, what the responses were. Number one, anybody want to guess what number one was? This is, this is for people. Engineers working at uh, uh, FINRA is a nonprofit, right? Uh, but they're very, very talented engineers. And they're actually a not for profit. They have very, very talented engineers, and their engineers were leaving. And um, so there's data scientists, big data engineers, <clears throat> and they ask, you know, what is the top thing you value in your job, specifically for like staying in the job? Anybody have an idea? No room for growth, that's one. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Uh, independence, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so it turned out, yeah, respect, uh, very interesting, Francis. Flexibility, let's get two more. This is actually very interesting. It might be the most important thing that you guys get today, uh, in, in my opinion, because it always, every time I, I, I talk about it, I forget it myself. And I remember how important it is, right? So uh, personal work, salary, flexibility. Okay, yeah. So it turns out the number one thing was stability. They were very concerned with, you know, hey, we want steady work. And that was number one, right? And that makes sense. So it wasn't so much about, you know, how much money. It was more like the expected value. Like, what's the probability that I can keep this job? Okay. And so, uh, so that was, that was number one. Number two was uh, uh, the, the salary, right? So they did care about payroll. They did care about how much they were making. Uh, and so those are the, the big ones, right? You have to be able to pay the mortgage. You have to be able to support your family. Okay, so we get that out of the way, right? So let's say you can't, let's say you can't tweak those knobs. There's certain things you can do, right? Like I'd love to pay everybody a million dollars, but the place will go bankrupt. Okay, I'd love to offer you a contract where you never get fired, but we couldn't do it. Right? It's not, it's not feasible. So what do you do? Okay, number three was um, independence and like enjoyment of the work. You had people who had been doing quality control, quality assurance for years and wanted to work on machine learning AI. Right, even part time, like, hey, you know, everybody else is doing this really exciting work. Can I please do a little bit of that? In fact, at Google, one day a week, they are uh, allowed to do whatever they want. Right, it has to be somewhat job related, but they have that independence to take on things. Those of you who are in fa academia, how much we value the ability to research what we want to research. I mean, we wouldn't probably do what we do if it wasn't for that. Right, for those of you who have not experienced that, it is. It is like a life-changing event to be able to basically pick what you want to go after on a large percentage of your time, right? And, and, and so much so that most people take pay cuts to do it. It's very, very important. Um, okay, so we had, we had uh, the stability, we had the uh, payroll, we had the amount of money, we had the, let's say, job flexibility with like what you're going after. And number four was appreciation feeling valued very good william yeah appreciation let me tell you something appreciation is cheap you can get it for nothing you did a great job that goes so far so far see somebody if you see somebody today or if you're talking to somebody today tell me you did a great job you guys are all doing a great job fantastic all right i'm 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 extraordinarily happy that you're all here and you're taking the time out of your data to learn more about data science and ai so and, and appreciation is is it's it's so meaningful and it goes so far. You can pay somebody less, but if they're appreciated, they'll stay. Pay somebody a whole lot of money and unappreciate them, and uh, you know make them feel uh, unimportant, they'll leave. Or emotional, right? So the the appreciation um, factor is enormous, enormous, and something that you please take that with you, right? It's important to to have met people 
and your, your contacts are important, but it's also very important to realize how far appreciation goes. Compliments will get you almost anything. Okay. And the last factor, which was one of my favorites, anybody want to guess? It's, and, it's, and it's known by large corporations, right? So we've talked about money, All right. So we talked about job security, money, uh, independence on, on tasks you want to take, so academic freedom, uh, intellectual freedom. Uh, we've talked about appreciation, All right? Anybody want to take a shot at the last one? Feeling happy, time off, it's a pretty good one. I'll give you a hint. It's, a, it's timely. It's timely. So it turns out the answer is Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they all know about it. Food. Food is a major factor. I'm telling you now, if you appreciate your employees, your students, your, your coworkers, and you find a way to bring food, good food, into the situation, you can probably pay them less. And they'll be happy. Right? Food goes along, it's a stimulant. All right? And so why is it at Microsoft, you never have to pay for food? And the food is served, it's like five-star chefs. It's crazy operation. If any of you ever get a chance to go to Redmond, don't eat for a week, and then go to Redmond and go to their cafeteria because the food is out of this world, all right? It's unbelievable. Google, same thing. Out of this world, completely free. And so uh, these types of things are very important, but you know, management is not even thinking about that. Management says we gotta pay them more. We can't do it, there's no way to pay them more, so it's just regular attrition. No, 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 no. If you can't pay them more, appreciate them. You know, buy pizza every other week or something. It goes a long way. You know, we had a specific complaint where one, one person said, you took away my uh, Coke machine and I've not been the same since. I want my Coke machine back. So, you, you know, you have to like, when you wait, and, and another thing about surveys, when the surveys are anonymous, that is gold. Anonymous surveys, gold. They change institutions if people are actually listening. The answer is out there. Right, the the true solution to improving the workplace or solving these crises is out there. You have to survey the right people. All right, so all about surveys. I'm telling you, if if you if you take nothing else from what we've talked about here today, go back to your organizations and survey. Do a small survey and see what people are actually thinking. See, you know, if there's something that you're trying to solve, see how they would approach it. Right, and and hopefully, you know, you glean something from that and make it anonymous so you get the actual answers. There is nothing like it. You may not be ready for the answer. There's nothing like it. Okay. All right. So in the spirit of that, okay, we're going to do a quick experiment. All right. Uh, John, how are we on time, by the way? Do you guys want to take a break? We can come back and do the experiment after the break if you'd like. Yeah. How do you all? Uh, let's put it, let's put it to the chat. I will survey. Okay. So if we get more than 10 people in the chat, that say break, uh, then we'll take a, let's say five to 10 minute break here. Yeah. So I'll open it up in the chat. Let's give it 60 seconds. You can respond if you'd like to take a break. Okay. Okay. You can break, break, break in 15 minutes, Francis, or, or 15 minutes. Okay. Break. So, uh, uh, Musa, I see break, break here. I even though this was virtual, the question was posted in the spring, but uh, I see uh, participant put break here. So, let's take. Thank you. Yeah. How do you all? Uh, let's put it. Let's put it to the chat. I will survey. Okay. So, if we get more than 10 people in the chat that say, A break, uh, then we'll take a, let's say five to 10 minute break here. Yeah. So I'll open it up in the chat. Let's give it 60 seconds. You can respond if you'd like to take a break. Okay. Uh, because since we've been talking about it, this is what happens. Um, all right. So I'll see everybody back at one and then we'll get into uh, a survey. Yeah. So yeah. Musa, if you can advance it a little it's bit. It's going to be for you to find Waldo. So who's Waldo? Waldo 
Are you able to see my mouse pointer, by the way? Wave your hand if you can see my mouse pointer. Yes. Yeah. Kind of? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you. Great. So Waldo is this gentleman over here with the white and red cap, peppermint shirt, glasses. And these um, problems are Waldo scattered in some audience. And when you find Waldo, uh, to let us know, uh, just put in the chat that you found Waldo. So you can say found him, all right? Uh, and what we'll do is we'll keep track of, let's say, the first five people. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then we'll discuss the results. It's always very interesting. OK, any questions? All right, so keep your, keep your uh, answers to the chat so that other folks can figure it out. We'll give it a maximum of 10 minutes so that we can keep things moving. And John, what, um, what time do we finish today? Uh, two o'clock. Two o'clock. Okay. So after this, um, we may move around a little bit outside of the slides because I also want to show you some modeling, right? Uh, and then we can also, we'll, we'll resume tomorrow, but okay. <clears throat> All right. So here we go. All right. I'm going to start it now. Uh, let me start the clock. By the way, uh, are, are any of you guys super survey people? I love surveys. Love, love, love survey people. So right, let's get the clock going. All right, I have my clock. Oh, you can't see the clock. Well, here's my clock. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to set the stopwatch. All right, so test it. OK, so I'm resetting it. All right, and I'm now going to get ready to unveil the Waldo. All right. Uh, if it's difficult, is, is it difficult to see the screen? Or, or is it clear so far? I'll, un I'll unveil the puzzle in a second, but from what you see so far, is it okay? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, good. All right, here we go. I'm starting the clock. All right. Waldo is somewhere in there. When you find him, uh, please put in the chat that you found him. Is, the, is it intelligible? Do you need me to make it larger somehow, or is it good? I think it's OK. Yes. Make it larger. Please. Yes, please. Larger. Make it larger? OK. All right, let me see if I can make it larger. OK, so I'm going to stop. And I'm going to bring this back to uh, a different screen. So let's go. I'm going to stop the. Presentation. Uh, mm, all right, so let me do this. Let that stop it. Okay, yeah, so let me share this screen. Screen one, screen two, screen one. Okay, hold on. Share. Okay, so now do you guys see my screen here? I'm going to try to make it larger. Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm going to hide this. Actually, here. More. Basically, uh, frame, the frame, uh, if you put it in Google Slides, uh, it will come in Zoom position rather than PowerPoint in slide mode. But right now, it's OK. OK, so let me see if I can hide this as well. Thank you, though. Um, uh, so hide floating meeting controls. OK, and let's see if we can get this to be larger for you. I don't want to clip anything though. And how do I? I think I can hide this. Okay. Is that better than what you had before? Not really. <laughs> okay. So the problem is, is if I zoom, it's busy, intentionally busy. Is it worse than it was before? Because I can put it back the other way. Zoom. Hmm? Okay, all right, try, try with this. 
Yeah, and if um, if anything, I'll extend the time out. But okay, I put the clock back on. See if you can find Waldo. Yeah. Someone has found him. Okay. Emmanuel and Jessica, how long ago? Okay, so that's three. Just now. Okay, good. Yeah. <clears throat> And let's wait for the first five. One, two. Okay, good. All right. So we have. Okay, so quite a few of her finding that. This is very interesting. Okay. So the first one was it looks that. Uh, let's see. Charlene. Are you, uh, are you here, Charlene? Uh, if you can tell us how you found him, if your audio is working, yeah, you see the participants here. Uh, and let me go to the chat here. Grid approach. Uh, so you started at what top left and made your way across? going lower and lower okay yeah so that's how okay super analytical approach okay so now let's see um uh kamala uh how did you find waldo hello can you hear me i can hear you mm -hmm. Hello. Um, so I basically, I, I don't know, I did it in quadrants. So I looked at my brain and immediately went to the the lowest left hand part of the picture. I don't know why. So uh -huh. I saw pink unicorn. Then I went to the upper quadrant before that. And then the next one, um, again, looking for red because I know he has stripes, red and white. Um, and then something told me to look where, I don't know, where the red isn't so obvious. <laughs> I don't know. And then I saw like the sign used games and then he just happened to be there. Like, so I saw sell your used games here and then used games and I saw him with the little sign. How interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So, so we had one grid approach, then you took a quadrant approach and then you took a, I think uh, they're trying to disinform me. So let me see where it would be not so obvious where he could be hidden. Yeah. Uh, and then you ultimately I say that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. And then uh, Francis. Uh, how did you find him? Yeah. Francis. And then we'll go to uh, Emmanuel and Jessica Bray. So let me see if Francis is writing in the chat. Scanning from top uh, to left. So, okay. That's, that's two for grid. Okay. And then uh, Emmanuel, how did you find Waldo? I, I did the scanning as well from top from left, top but left. then I had a photo on with him. Pay more attention to red stuff and try to find the face, uh -huh. especially the glasses. Okay. And then um, <clears throat> uh, let's look uh, after and Jessica Bray. Yeah, so for me, I kind of did a once over and then I was looking at the very populated areas because I figured he would be hidden among other people. And Jessica, can you explain your once over? So you, you went through a grid? Yeah, so just scanning from left to right in yeah. sort of like different rows, I guess. And then after that, you said, let me look for densely populated areas because he may be hidden again. Mm hmm. Very, very interesting. Okay, uh, <clears throat> just because I find it so fascinating. Uh, uh, Krishna Kumar. Yeah, I did the same thing, you know, started from the left and kept going. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Christian Dai. She can let us know. And let's just do one more. Um, uh, let me see. So um, anybody want to try to find what of in this video also? 
and put in the chat. Only one person was able to see so far. That's uh, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, yeah, Dr. Mitchell was able to find what. Anybody else? I mean, you guys can unmute and, and, and talk if you want to. This is Dr. Mitchell. I use the technique of scanning. I started from the top right and then scanned back and forth through the picture. Great. Anybody else? Who was able to find Wado? Nana, are you able to see? <laughs> no. Uh, right here. Is, can you can you guys see my mouse? Yeah, we can see your mouse. Yeah, that that's that's him. Seeing red, white. Anybody? Everybody, can you see? Yeah. Doctor Mitchell, that's what you saw, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's continue. Uh, Kareem, Joan Franklin. I did the um, quadrant approach. So I checked the bottom left quadrant and then I kind of went to the right and then found them. How like fascinating. Top right. Okay, so you went from, it's interesting, and I wonder if it's because of the, the pink jumps out, so your eye will go f automatically tracks like the highest contrast or brightest uh, areas and images. So, <clears throat> and, and the author may have known that, right? So he may have dissuaded you by going into the bottom left and then obfuscating Waldo in the you know, top right. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Does anybody have a totally different attack on how they found Waldo? Yeah, actually, um, I used like a random approach, but I was mainly looking for a red and white stripe kind of pattern. Uh, can you, and so who, who was just speaking? Sorry. Oh, I'm Jyotirmai. Hi, Jyotirmai. So can you explain the random approach? <clears throat> I was actually mainly focusing uh, on um, the pattern, like the red and white stripes to see. Um, so I was focusing on where I can see the red and white colors in the, in the picture. So that's how I found him. Okay. Any other interesting attacks? Hello? Hi. Mm -hmm. Um, this is Isabel. So how I found him was I had to like, you know, in my mind section the population. Then by section I had to look to see if someone like what was there if I found him at the top right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Any other uh, any other attacks? I ruled out specific. Areas he could not be. Augustine, can you explain that? I ruled out specific areas he could not be. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What happened is I went by, if I can only rule out the potential areas given his features, then I can really move on to the next step. In other words, if I can reduce the error that I'm looking at, 
that I don't have to spend much time because if I go to that area, well, possibly he couldn't be there because his feet just, just don't show up. So it is simply by ruling out, uh, you know, the features that I'm looking for. If they're not there, then I'm not going to spend time with that area at all. So I have to move on to the next area. So by differentially ruling things out, I was able to say, boom, there it is, because essentially I cannot rule that out. Uh, now, but nonetheless, I still explore other areas. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So what is the high level feature that you use to roll, uh, rule out? The physical attributes were crucial to me. And then I was attended again. I, sorry, I signed on this a little late because I was trying to get in there. So I didn't miss the, I missed the kind of first part. But I look at the physical descriptions that he presented. So I was not sure about what, you know, for example, uh, the height, the weight, the size. And I actually said, wait a minute, given what I have, what are the likely places where this individual could be trapped? So those feature features allow me to form a kind of hypothesis moving forward. Yeah. Uh, before we reveal where he is, does anybody else have a? Thank you so much. Um, don't don't worry if you can't find it. And the reason I say that is, first, it depends on your screens, right? There's so many variables at play here, right? We're doing this virtually, so it's not a scientific study, but it's uh, you know we're doing this partially because I want to you know encourage you to survey uh, for data for your models uh, and also um, <clears throat> to uh, see how people think differently. I think it's wonderfully, I think it's, I think it's wonderful hearing different uh, attacks and, and strategies to these problems, right? And how, how we are wired similarly, but we're different, right? Um, does anybody else have uh, an interesting attack on how they arrived at Waldo? Uh, top to bottom. Okay. Looking at the presentations where participants gather. Okay. So I can also tell you having uh, experience in Waldo tends to help. Uh, you may not know why you're better at it, but you're better at it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let's, let me see, left to right, top to bottom. Okay. Yeah. So when I do it, uh, I've changed. Okay. But I am informed about this now, but in the beginning when I would do it, um, like most of you, I would start top left, uh, and work my way across in a typewriter fashion. And I would be looking for key features, you know, particularly the red and the white. Now, the author is very smart because he's disguised all that red and white into one area. So as you scan, you'll quickly be like, oh, it's not there. Or you, can, you can go past it, right? Now, once you've seen Waldo, it's like you can't unsee him, which is also very interesting, right? Your brain is translating things for you. Um, but I've since changed the way I approach it by looking for... Um, what the uh, using some intuition from one of the attacks announced earlier, which is I look for where he's uh, most likely to be hidden. Right. So I would not look at the top left right away because it's too obvious. Right. But you you only you only see that after you look at these problems a certain amount of times. At least I only saw that. Some of you are much more intuitive, and you were able to you know figure out and decipher that it's he's been hidden where would be an interesting place to hide him right so um uh let's see so who who was it uh i think it was the second answer uh where is it is it uh charlene how did charlene you found him first right you went through grid is that right and i think uh was it kamala you you decided to well, Charlene. You found him first, so let's let you unveil it. So I think your audio may be off though. So let's see this. Zooming the screen in and then going area by area. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, 
So Charlene, since you're, I think your audio may be off, Kamala, can you Kamala? unveil where he is? Hi, um, it's actually pronounced Camila. Um, Camila, I'm sorry. Sorry, I, I didn't get a chance during introductions because I had a lot of noise in the background, so I typed in my intro on in the chat, but he is beside the sign that says used games, $99.99. Yeah. He's beside a stack of boxes that, yeah. Fantastic. Right. He's actually holding up help and that too. So don't feel bad if you don't find him. Uh, when I conduct this experiment, uh, every time, there are some folks where it takes 10 to 15 minutes. There are some people who get it in seconds. Uh, the fastest I've ever seen it done is like four seconds. But that person, um, I don't know, maybe has great eyesight and had done Waldo problems in their past. Right. So maybe the brain gets better at deciphering the, the patterns. And, and again, the heuristics that we picked up that we know where they're probably going to be hidden. Okay. So, all right, let me move to the next. Uh, okay, so, okay, good. So here, the key thing I want, and we're just because we're running short on time, the key thing I want you to take from this is people are wonderfully different, right? And look at how the interaction led to different approaches. And I can tell you that um, this is the first time that, and I do this every term for the last, you know, 10 years now, okay? Uh, this is the first time I've heard, I deliberately looked for where he'd probably be hidden. Uh, like, where would it make most sense to hide this person? Okay, And it is also the first time I've heard that I wanted to rule things out. All right, so every time I hear, you know, something new, right? So I, I've gained from this already, so thank you for that. Okay. <clears throat> So congratulations on finding Waldo. Again, for everybody, see if I can zoom in here. And this is one of the, and admittedly, this is one of the hardest Waldos there is. There are incredibly difficult ones. And I searched uh, everywhere I could to find one that was very, very difficult and you found it. So, um, okay, good. So let me minimize this. Oh, I think I have to. Uh, I think I've made it too large now. Hold on. Hang on. Oh, here. Uh, and I moved it. Okay. Um, we can talk more about missing data. I want to, while I, while I have you, who is familiar with the target story um, regarding the target's ability to predict um, what a father and his daughter uh, were going through. Has anybody heard this story? Has everybody heard this story? Let's start there. Your participants. <clears throat> Where are the participants? Uh, let me raise this. And then the video screens. Just a second. I'm starting to see the panel again for all of you. So participants. Oh, because I'm sharing the screen, that's why. All right, so let me do a new share. And let's do screen three, um, which I think is, let's be sure. This should be screen three, share. All right, let me push this down. And where did the Zoom participants go? Here. Okay, and then here. Okay, so can you guys see this? This is a, a page from the New York Times. You all see this? I have it in dark mode. But let me let me change this out. Uh, and I don't know where your. I don't know why I can't see your. Let me close this and then open this again. All right, so the chat, participants. I lost your video screen, so I don't see you. Let me see if I can pull that back. I think that's the video panel. Show the video panel. There you are. Okay, good. So now let's pull you over here so I can see you guys. All right. Um, I just have to make it smaller. Just a sec. This way. 
And if you can see the uh, New York Times article, just wave your hand to the, or wave any hand you'd like. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. And I'll move this panel out of the way so that we can go forward here. Okay. So um, I'll give you, uh, I'll post this in the, um, let me take off the dark reader. I'll let you guys vote on it too. You can, we can see this in um, light or we can see this in brace now. Okay. So do you prefer that or do you prefer the dark? What do you think? I think, I think it's okay. This is good, William? Yes, please. Oh, my okay. Side. Okay. Okay. I, I don't know about the other side. So I'll uh, let me post this in the chat for you as well. Okay. So um, the uh, let me give you a backdrop. Okay. So what happens? This is back in 2010 is when I think the incident actually happened, and it was published in the New York Times uh, on Feb 16, 2012, and it is one of the best articles. Uh, I've ever read about data science, and it's older. The techniques used are not even AI te techniques. They're all statistical techniques, but they're that effective, okay? And so here's what happens. It's uh, a father and his daughter uh, walk into Target, and the father says, uh, I want to see the manager. He's very upset, fuming hot. Okay. The daughter is, you know, I think 16 years old. She's very, she's embarrassed by the whole situation. Um, and the father says, I want to see the manager. Okay, so fine. Uh, store attendant goes and gets the manager. Manager comes out, says, you know, how can I help you? And the father says, I received an ad for um, my, you know, my daughter got some advertising for like cribs and baby clothes. Right. And um you know and, and i'm you know furious like are you trying to you know, persuade her to you know get pregnant she's only a, she's a minor what is going on here okay and and the father's irate okay so uh the manager says sir you know that's done by corporate uh, we don't set the the, the ads up or um, but I can inquire to corporate as to why this has happened, and I'm, you know, very sorry. And the father is disgruntled, and he says, you know, you guys are irresponsible. And he storms out of the, the, the store, and, um, uh, you know, again, the daughter is extremely, uh, um, you know, embarrassed by the situation, and they leave. Okay, so a couple of weeks go by, and the manager calls the father and says, you know, sir, I've uh, had a chance to look into this. And uh, it's set by corporate. And what we do is we look at statistics of people's buying patterns and are able to figure out, um, you know, what what uh, their situations might be. Right? And the, before he goes in to elaborate, the father says, "Let me stop you right there. It seems that there were some things that I was unaware of, and that um, Target effectively." predicted that my daughter was pregnant um, before I found out that she was in fact pregnant, right? So, you know, he apologizes to um, the store manager uh, and the store manager is like, okay, this is even odder than it was to begin with, okay? Uh, but they, they move on and he realizes that Target's uh, predictive power is uh, very, very sharp and the, the story ends. And so then the article goes on to talk about uh, how it is that Target was able to pull this off. And before I go any further, let me just put this in the chat. But uh, who's heard this story before? Any of you? Yeah, uh, William, you have? Yeah. Um, you can just put, yeah, put it in the chat if you have. Yeah, yeah, you have. Okay. Here's the article link. Okay. So there are several extraordinarily important points in this article. Uh, the first thing is they did a lot of research uh, in psychology and 
human behavior and mice studies in order to figure out what it is to get people to, to figure out how to persuade people to figure out how to advertise like you have to figure you have to unpack how the human mind works so that your advertising and your your uh, inventory and the way that you present this stuff is more appealing than someone else so that you achieve more sales okay so they did a lot of research and what they found is that it's not so much it's not so much how you advertise but it's more how you can manipulate the uh, the patients or the clients so what they found is that first most of the 40 percent of the time this is an approximation but 40 percent of the time human beings are functioning on habits we're doing things that are subconscious but are effective right like we're not thinking about you know deeply about what's happening we're just sort of going through the motion motions and your mind is wired to do that, right? The, the, the brain has a whole system to, to govern you and take you through habitual processes so that you can focus on what's really important. Okay, great, priority systems. So what they do is they target the habitual processes within you to get you to do what they want, right? So let me give you an example. How many of you uh, and you can put it in the chat, actually click on internet advertising. I have never clicked on one of those ads. And ads have been here for decades. I've never clicked on one of those ads. Now, TikTok, I don't know what is going on with TikTok, but have you noticed that TikTok's ads are like, at least to me, are, are somewhat compelling. I'm like, this is, these are, this is amazing. Like, what is this thing? Okay. Now, is it that, is it that it's amazing or is it that I'm being conditioned to think it's amazing? And the other point of this is none of us, let's say the majority of us are not clicking on internet ads, yet internet ads are what fund businesses. So why do businesses spend money, enormous amounts of money on internet ads when no one's clicking them. I don't even read them. I actively try to avoid them. Does any, do any of you try to read the internet advertising? Like we try to, you know, I've tried to minimize the screen so you don't have to see it, All right? So the question then is why do they do it? And the reason they do it is because even though, there's two things. One, you may stumble upon it as you're trying to learn something and it'll, it'll be absorbed by your mind. And enough of those stumbles will lead to associations in your mind that change the way you think about things. And we think by association. I say red, maybe you think about a stop sign. I say, I say red, maybe you think about blood, right? But these associations are there. That's what's going on. And if they can get enough of those ads into your mind, the associations will start to form. You'll start to think about Walmart, or maybe you'll think about Target. They put red out, you might think about Target just because Target's colors are red, right? So that's the first one. You may stumble upon it. The second one is even if you are not actively reading it and trying to avoid the ads, which I do, that does not mean your brain didn't see it, right? I mean, your brain assimilated what was on the screen. It absorbed it. And subconsciously, those images and those colors and the numbers and the ad that was there are within you. You've just minimized it. It's lower priority, but it is there, right? There's an enormous amount of information that we take in and it gets processed, some of which at lower levels, some of which is subconscious. And largely, that subconscious advertising is enough to get people to do what the advertisers want, buy this product. So the article goes on to say that uh, we did study to see what it is that people want, but it, they learned that they could control what it is that you want through advertising. 
you know, why, why did I choose to wear blue today? I don't know. I mean, for me, it was what was the clean shirt I had in, in, in the closet. But it, if I had another option, I may have chose it for some reason. Why? Right? The stimulus is around us impact us. So it's, it's one thing. You remember uh, fans of The Matrix? I've seen the last one. It was not so great. Sorry. But the first one, it's very interesting when he's talking to the Oracle. Right? And he, he, uh, she says, don't worry about it. And he breaks a vase or something. Okay. And, and uh, he says, how did you know I was going to break the vase? And she says, what's really going to bake your noodle is, would you have broke it had I not said something about it? Right. So um, take, a, take a look at this article. And if you think that things aren't predictable, I'm telling you human beings are predictable. We're state of the art. But if you look at phenomena, and how we move, the patterns are, you know, undeniable. And uh, I noticed that when we started looking at COVID data and when we started looking at uh, drug data and the patterns amongst people are shocking, right? Those of you who are psychologists or in the field of medicine, you can see it, like the, the responses and the behaviors are repetitive, right? even if not predictable, repetitive. Okay, so take a look at that, right? We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Where are we in time? Sorry. Okay, 136. Uh, let's go back to the slides quickly. And let me share. Oh, sorry. There's some stuff in the chat. I don't because they subconscious position the product in your head. So when you see it in person enough, it convinces you to at least inquire about it. That's right. Yeah. So um, that is correct. Yeah, I so much now, in particularly the, those of you who have children who play games, like I always pay to get rid of the advertising just because I don't want the kids to get programmed. Right. And um, it's, 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 it's two days. So that's a new game. Pay us to get rid of the advertising. All right. New share. Screen one. Share. Let me take this out and put this back on. Okay. Um, all right. Let's let's go. Uh, let me see if I can fire something up for you. I, I'm feeling adventurous since the world almost ended this morning. Uh, let's take a look at here. All right. So we'll post this for you in Code.io or Codio, however you want to say it. Um, but let me close this. All right, so I will continue to pick up the slides, but since I have only so much time with you, I want to give you something tangible um, uh, as, we, as we go forward. And um, you know, what, what, is, what is it about data science and, and Python? Right, a lot of you had mentioned Python uh, in your expectations. And let me hide this here. So a lot of you have mentioned Python in your, expect, uh, in your expectations. And the thing is, R is great. And there's, you could get into why one language is better than the other. But the big thing about Python, to me, is Jupyter. How many of you have used Jupyter? You raise your hand or wave your hand, yeah. Jupiter is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Like before, if you were going to pick up a language, you would have to spend so much time learning uh, about the IDE, right? The interactive development environment. So you know, we had things like Eclipse. I don't know if any, some of you use Eclipse, some uh, NetBeans and Visual Studio and PyCharm. There were all these things that you had to do, R Studio, right? There are all these tools that you had to get your head around. And Jupyter is wildly simple. It's a web page. You know, it's, it's astonishing. Like, you look at, like, they have this concept and they're called notebooks. I use something called Jupyter Lab. Um, you can use any variant you want. But if you ask me, the breakthrough that really kind of pushed Python forward was the merging of it in and in, in Jupiter, right? So, um, or 
IPython notebooks is what it was, and then it turned into Project Jupyter. And what's happened is, is instead of you having to download, I mean, we still install it, but now these things are available online through things like Collab. Um, and uh, yeah, so th things like Collab or AWS SageMaker. Uh, now you can load up this web page and just start writing Python inside of it. And as much as I love object oriented programming, it just allows you to write as you would in a notebook. That's, that's the concept behind it, right? So, so, and what happens is, is you can do things like imports and you just have, like I hit shift return to go, but you can just come in here and also hit run. And you can basically click these, you know, runs and it executes these blocks, Lego blocks, if you will, of code for you uh, in in almost like a debug manner. So, you know, when you're when you're writing software and things go wrong uh, and, and you have a major bug or, or and it's too tricky to just solve with print statements, what we do is something called debugging. And debugging is we, we set a point in the code and we we step through it line by line so that we can see what's happening within the software okay and jupiter does that for you automatically because that's actually an excellent way to develop so it's almost like you're debugging as we are going forward right as, as you're as you're writing so like for example here i'm going to read in a csv file from this pandas library and pandas we'll talk more about this tomorrow as we step through the notebook but um, pandas is a library for data analysis uh, and its central output is this uh, software object called a data frame, which is a, it is a table. But you have to like just this simple this simple operation. So we import pandas. You can call the pandas library whatever you want. I call it PD, so I don't have to write pandas. But you could have just said pandas. And NumPy is for arrays, very very fancy arrays with a whole bunch of uh, statistical uh, functions for them. And sklearn metrics, you'll see that when we look at um, uh, confusion matrices to evaluate these models. All of this comes tomorrow. I'll take you through it. Uh, and then we set some uh, options for these uh, data frames, right? So I want all the, the column widths and I want, I don't want you to truncate the column widths and I don't want you to truncate the columns either. And then you can just say pd.read and then give it the path to your CSV. So a lot of data is in CSVs. And the, if you just say P, which is the last, uh, which is the last variable in a cell, it will output uh, a shortened version. Well, I've said don't truncate. So it will output the entire table uh, in the notebook for you. Now, just doing this, reading a CSV file and getting a visual view of it with highlighting in Java is a couple of days of work, right? Reading the CSV file, no problem. But to get a visualization like this, where you could call, let's say you're talking to the domain expert uh, in, in the, uh, of the CSV file. Let's say it's family medicine, or in this case, it's uh, like this could be patient data. In this case, it happens to be basketball data. For the basketball fans in the room, I'm a very large Kyrie Irving fan. And so uh, when he moved to the Celtics, I started looking at their data, right? And, um, you know, I could call Kyrie over. He's not a data scientist. He's busy, you know, becoming the best ball handler we've ever seen. And uh, I could say, hey, does this, you know, line up with what you're talking about? This is how I have imported this data. You know, what, what of these fields do you think are important? I'm trying to build a model for, you know, what it is that you have to do in order to win. You know, do you have to, um, score a lot of points or do you have to rebound better right and he would be able to come over and look at the screen and say yeah yeah you know i i think these three factors are important or this or this is all i look at and now you're having that conversation with the domain owners so that you can understand again like when we were working with arcos the technical issues are not the problem the real problem is trying to understand from a data scientist point of view is trying to understand the domain so we can figure out, well, where do we start? What is important? How do you make these decisions? How did you find Waldo, right? These are the things that are very important. Okay, so Python and Jupyter allow you to do that right here, right? It's, it's, it's seamless. And it, I think it is that 
that really push them forward. Now, uh, let me give you uh, an example of, well, since we have it here, okay. So you have this data and um, what happened is I looked at the first, what is this, 36? 33, uh, starting at zero, so 34. 34 games uh, in, I think this is the 2019 season. And I wanted to know if there was a way to predict um, if the Celtics would win based on certain factors, right? So, and, and I, I thought about that because when I, when I saw basketball players, and you see it in all sports, uh, they'll be giving a post-game conference and they'll say, um, okay, you know, what happened tonight? The, the reporters will ask them what happened. And the maybe more analytical players will look at the stat sheet and say, well, you know, they out-rebounded us 20 to 10 in, in the fourth quarter, so there's no way we could win, right? And so they, they, they point at these things, but obviously it's a combination of factors. So I said, you know, is there a way to automate that? Is there a way to look at this this data, these, these factors that are tracked in games and predict if they will win or lose, right? And if you look at this, it's already, here's the thing, human beings are state of the art. We are state of the art, but our pattern, some of you may be able to find it, okay? But our pattern matching on data of this size, and this is not even big data, we're talking about 34 rows, is already a problem. There's too many combinations. You could say, well, okay, you, when you score less than 100 points, you lose. Well, does that hold up? So, and that's just one variable. So what do you do? So, okay, you lost, you won, you won, you lost, you won, you won, you won, you won, you lost at 100, and it was above 100. So that doesn't hold, okay? So then you start saying, well, do we put our best offensive players on the field? Uh, it depends. Maybe it depends on what happens if it's Philadelphia, okay? But what if you were trying to find it in general, no matter what happens, what are the things you have to focus on? So that you as a coach or the general manager can say, this is where the team needs to focus its efforts. When we go into this next game, you guys need to do X, Y, and Z so that you always win. And if you don't, this is what's gonna happen. Can it be done? Everybody with me? Kind of just wave your hands if you're with me. Yeah? Okay, good, great. So, so can it be done? And it turns out that it can be done. Right? And, and, and how would you do it? We would step through one way to do it. The, the, some of you may have a semantic way to do it, okay? But the grid way to do it is you would walk through the combinations of each of these columns with the wins and the losses and see if you could discern a pattern. It's okay, you can't say it's just when you are less than 100 points, it may be, if you're less than 100 points and you got out rebounded or you shot a certain percentage from the three point line right so what what are those factors how do you figure and, and the con now listen this is not even a big data set and the combinations are overwhelming right human beings will get crushed by this so it turns out and we will get more into it uh and you'll see it in depth in further lectures uh that there are ways to completely automatically have the machines look at this data and discern the properties of whether or not you will win or lose given these factors. And I'll just, I'll take you to it uh, so that you can see it because I, I want you to, to see the predictive power of all this stuff, right? Like I, I can continue to give you slides, but I just feel like the audience is too educated. And so I want you to see something tangible, right? So, um, Although this is an intro, I think you all are ready for it, right? There's a very, very sophisticated audience. Okay, so, so I'll take you through more of this as we go through. But essentially, we take all these features, columns. Features are nothing but columns, right? And we say, hey, I, I want to know when someone wins or loses. So that's what I'm going to predict, okay? And uh, I'm going to feed you this data, right? These are the X data points. So I'm going to feed you... The, the how many points you scored, field goals made, field goal percentage, your three-point shooting, your free throw shooting. Everybody makes noise about free throws. It's real. Uh, your rebounding assists, steals, blocks, turnovers, okay? And we can get more factors, but I'm just going to send you this. And I want to know if we can make sense of it, okay? And so we send all that through, and there is an algorithm called 
uh, decision tree algorithm. Who's used decision trees? Wave your hands if you use decision trees. Yeah, decision trees are incredibly useful and incredibly uh, uh, not used enough because everybody is talking about uh, neural networks and everybody is talking about like random forests, but random forests are essentially decision trees. They're just, you know, groups of decision trees. Uh, but you hear a lot about deep learning, you hear a lot about regression, but decision trees are sort of the lost art. And what they do is that just like we said, they step through every combination and they find these patterns and they take some optimization optimization steps to figure out which columns to target first so that the algorithm is efficient, right? And so by, by doing that, by walking the columns and the combinations uh, and computing something called entropy, which we'll talk about, uh, they are able to discern, let me take you to, um, this is one of them, but I'll take you to the final one, right? Because we, we do it a couple of times. So whenever I talk about cross-validation, the answers are going to depend on where you train test split. So we run it multiple ways, okay? So let me just, since we're running close on time, let me take you to the last one. I think this is, okay. All right. So this is the final model of the Celtics data, all right? And I'll do my best to explain like the terminology uh, so that it makes sense, right? So what did the model find? What did it find? The model found that if, and left is always true, okay? So it reads as when this condition is true, we go to the left. And when this condition is false, we go to the right, okay? So what happened? Every time you scored less than 98 points, you lost, All right? Every time that happened, let's go, let's go check it. Hopefully I have the orders right, right? So, <clears throat> so this is a sample, loss, loss, all right? So remember we picked the number, I said 100, all right? And, and a coach might say 100, but it's not 100. It's actually 98, okay? So, and this is on a, a, a small set of data, okay? So it found that every time you score less than or equal to 98 points, you lose. So no matter what, no matter who the opponent is, you lose. So you have to score more than 98 points, okay? So I, as a coach, am going to say, I need players who can score more than 98 points. Right? And I know who, how, what the averages are. I know who is likely to score well against certain mass matchups. So I'm going to do what I can to try to get to 100, 90, 99 to 100, like first thing, okay? Then they said, all right, so that's the case. We can tell you straight away what happens if you score less than 98 points, it's a loss. So what else can we find, all right? If you did not score less than 98 points, right? So uh, if you did score more, that does not mean you automatically win. Okay, so if you score less than 98, it's a loss. 100 on 100. You score less than 98 points, it's a loss. All right? But if you score more than 98 points, so 99 points, it's still up in the air. All right? It's still up in the air. So what did they find? They found that if personal, the, what the model find? If personal fouls is less than 15, all right, so you scored a lot of points. Say you scored 100 points, okay? And your personal fouls is less than 15, you lose. And by the way, you'll, we'll get more into it. The order of this decision tree, the variables that come first are important because they are the best predictors. The points was the most certain, which is why we present it first. It breaks the classes up the most, right? You'd ideally, like, you don't want the tree to be wide. You want it to be clean and like tight with wins and losses. The complexity will be too much for human beings to understand otherwise. You'll see some examples. Okay, so what does that mean? So you scored a lot of points, but the personal fouls were low, let's say higher low. Let's say you only have 15 um, personal fouls. So that implies that when you 
score a lot of points, but you don't play defense. Because when you play defense hard, you tend to foul. Right? You don't play any defense, there's no fouls. Okay? But you play a lot of defense, you play very hard, you tend to foul. So if you play a lot of offense, but you don't play a lot of defense, you're still going to lose. Okay? Now you have to think about how wild this is. Imagine that uh, you know, you're the coach and you're in the fourth quarter and you only have five personal fouls. Okay? You would have to tell the team, start fouling people. Play harder defense. All right? Uh, and, the, and, the, and the teammates are going to be like, what is wrong with this coach? There's a guy in the Toronto Raptors. They, I forget his name. <sighs> Someone remind me. But they say he's a mad scientist because he's always looking at these combinations. But the math is real. If you score more than 98 points and you have less than 15 personal fouls, you lose. 100 on 100. That's another thing about decision trees. It, there are many combinations. There's something called association rules, which we'll talk about, which will give you all the combinations. But and, and they give you combinations at different confidences. So for example, maybe 85% of the time that you score more than 98 points, you win. Okay? But decision trees, and that's why they call them decision trees, decision trees are 100 on 100. Right? Every time this happened, it is 100% with this following. Okay? So there's no, you know, X percentage. It is 100. Okay? So... All right, so let's keep going. So you don't play a lot of offense. You play a lot of offense. You don't play that much defense, you lose. Okay. The next thing is, so now let's say you played good offense, you scored over 100 points, over 98 points, and you fouled the other team enough, right? It's still not uh, certain what's going to happen. Now it depends on how many blocks you get. Okay. So uh, SK Learn treats this as a... Um, uh, as a float, but it's actually uh, less than or equal to two, right? So if you have less than two blocks in the game, you lose. Even if you score well and you foul the other team furiously, okay? If you don't get two blocks, you lose, which means that you not only have to play defense, but you have to play it well. You have to block some shots. Two is not even that many, right? Okay, so if you don't get the blocks, you lose. All right, great. Then what happens? Okay, you did all that, right? So you, you've, I, we're almost there. So you, uh, you scored a lot of points, you played good defense, you blocked some shots. Okay, then if the personal fouls, and this is, look at this, it's come back to the same variable. We have personal fouls up here, right? If personal fouls is less than 24.5, so less than 24, so you're greater than 15, right? and less than uh, 24, less than or equal to 24, you win, All right? So what does that mean? You can't just foul them indefinitely. You have to score a lot of points, yes. You have to play good defense. You gotta get a couple of blocks, two blocks, and you can't foul them indefinitely. You gotta foul them judiciously. You win, 100 on 100, right? And um, yeah, let's see if I can want this. And then so, uh, so if you do that, great. But if you don't score, if you, if you foul more than that, it's still a chance. Okay. Yeah, let's say you went crazy and you had 30 fouls, 30 personal fouls, then it's going to come down to how well you shot. Right? So if the field goal attempts is less than or equal to 92, right? So how many shots were taken overall? Then, uh, we come this way. And if it's less, if it's greater than 92, which means you took a lot of shots, you win, All right? And we can continue to go. I feel like we're running out of time here. Let me finish it. And then offensive rebounding. So again, if you did not take that many shots, it's going to come down to offensive rebounding. And if you had a very, if you had not that many rebounds, you lose. Even if you scored well, even if you defended well, even if you uh, uh, blocked some shots, if you don't get offensive rebounds, um, you're going to lose. And if you do get offensive rebounds that are greater than nine, so 10 or higher, you win. Now, the thing I want you to see from this is, and we'll wrap up here, those combinations of things that are infallible, 100 on 100 throughout this small data set, are impossible for humans to find. Like, we would never find that pattern. But the machines can find it very, very quickly. And this is a simple example with a few inputs and a single output of win or loss. 
the, the decision trees can actually target multiple variables. We want to know not only did you win or lose, but ticket sales, right? So you, the owner cares about ticket sales. He may not even care if he wins or loses. Okay. So uh, more to come on this. We'll post all this uh, and I'll turn it over to John. And if you have any questions, we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you, everybody. Okay. John, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry. Uh I think that's the end of the thing. I think he's muted. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're muted, John. I'm yeah. muted. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, Mr. Yeah, so you thank you again. Pause. Yeah, yeah. Pause it. And then, uh, as uh, you can see, this is for just. Uh, Foundations of data science is just uh, giving a very broad overview of the key elements of data science. And as you saw uh, in the presentation, it talks about what, uh, I mean, knowledge in algebra, calculus, differential equations, statistics, and others. And then toward the, uh, the, the latter part of it, now talking about very key uh, technical items, including uh, programming, and then what we did in the past and what we are going to do uh, for this series is what using uh, Python. So that is more technical. And then in week two, uh, uh, Dr. Musta will lead a uh, 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 discussion on uh, Python uh, programming, especially for those who have uh, little or no knowledge in in, in, in Python. So tomorrow we're going to continue with our foundations of data science, just reviewing Professor Prem's uh, our presentation last spring. Then again, Dr. Musa, uh, uh, William, myself, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Yabua Fihini will be here. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask those questions. If you want to go, go over the uh, presentation again, you have access to the recordings, you can do so. If you have any questions, just send this to us and then we'll respond to your questions. So any questions from anyone before we call it a day for today? I mean, we'll meet again tomorrow, same time, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. A any questions? Okay, so I see a question in, in the chat here. I said, do we have access to the slides? Yes, I believe we do. And Nana, that is right, right? Do they have access to the, the slides? I will, I'll post them uh, to get help. Okay, so that, that will be posted as uh, he says. So check the uh, GitHub and then you will find, get access to the slides. Any other questions? So uh, is it where is it where it's gonna be uh the recording as well as uh, as far as like this uh GitHub so we're gonna have access to the site and the recording too. The the, rec the recording is in your the mail that you got that has Zoom link. If you scroll to the bar bottom, that's a mm -hmm. that's a recording there. You see day one, day two. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right. Okay. Any further yes. questions? You, you you receive uh uh a different link for tomorrow it's not the same zoom link you receive another link for tomorrow i believe so okay so it's so gonna be different zoom link for every day um yes you 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 uh yeah actually it's actually online actually Yes, what I, I have is structured right now is there'll be a bit different Zoom link per week. So the same link that you got today should work for tomorrow, um, but it won't work next week. Okay. So each each yeah. Each, but you'll give it, you'll get a few reminder emails before the before the event, so you have the exact link to go to the Zoom. Can you can you please repeat that again, Ashley? They will receive reminder emails prior to each uh, day with the Zoom link in it. So you will uh, have access to the exact Zoom link that you will need for the event. All right, thank you. No problem.
Yeah, so what Ashu is saying is every week will be uh, a different uh, Zoom link. That, that is, uh, I mean, we do a module per week. So every module will have uh, the same Zoom link, but different modules will have their own uh, Zoom link. So you want to uh, check your emails for those. Any further questions? Yeah, so if there are no further questions, then thank you all again for coming, and then we'll see you all tomorrow at the same time. And, and, and John, was there, was there mention of uh, uh, office hours? I, I, miss, I, may, I may have missed that. Ah, th there wasn't. Um, okay, maybe you can talk about it, because uh, I, I was thinking the office hours would be during the main sessions, but if you want to conduct office hours during oh. the three training sessions, so that, that will be fine. Oh, okay. So, so we'll say we'll, we'll just say that maybe uh, weekends. I think the weekends might be uh, if 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 there's a demand for it. Otherwise, uh, so so let's see. So if 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 uh, students think uh, they will need office hours, they should just uh, alert uh, maybe Stacy uh, uh, or just send you an email. And then once we find out that we have uh, enough students, then we have. Uh, uh, office hours uh, over the, on the weekends. I think that that would be uh, uh, all right. Right, I think that, that would help. So that, so that if someone is struggling, they don't have to wait till the main session. They, they can uh, make use of the resources yeah, available. Okay. All yeah. right, all right. Yeah, we'll do that, yeah. Okay, sure, thanks. Yeah, so yeah, we can repeat that tomorrow. Uh, I think uh, today wasn't very, very technical. So if tomorrow's presentation is, a little bit more technical than we can have the office hours sure. over the weekend. Okay, sure. Thanks a lot. All right. Any further questions? <laughs>